Father Giles, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to talk to you. Um, and thank you very much for doing so. I thought if I could perhaps go through a set of elementary, fairly elementary questions about the Benedictines to start with, because I know only a little about them and I need to learn more since they're so important in the development of Western civilization. When were they founded? Well, St. Benedict's conventional dates, because we don't know them exactly, cover the end of the 400s up to the beginning of the 500s. And he lived uh, in Rome. He left Rome when he was quite young, in his early teens, St. Gregory tells us, and became a hermit and uh, learned the monastic craft, if you like, and then in the conventional way of monastic movements, other people heard of his reputation and came and joined him. And uh, when you live on your own, you can be quite free, but when there are several people trying to live together, you have to order, organize your life a bit more. And so eventually he produced a rule, the rule of St. Benedict, which we have and live today, 1,500 years later. And to cut a very long story short, this rule made its way uh, by its adaptability. As Gregory says, he, St. Benedict's rule is particularly famous for its, its balance, its discretion. It tends to lay down principles and then say, all right, but if your local circumstances or if your wisdom dictate otherwise, well, do otherwise. And so it's adaptable, and now it's on every continent. It's in Australia, it's in Vietnam, it's in Japan, North America, South America, Africa, everywhere. And uh, that's the story. What it concentrates on is seeking God. That's what a monk is for, someone who seeks God, especially in prayer in singing psalms, in reading the Bible, in work, serving the brethren. It's a balanced life, something for the head, something for the heart, something for the hands. And it's done in community, so everybody is supporting everybody else. It's not a solitary quest. And uh, it's very humane in the broadest sense. And we are its heirs today in this building, which was built 750 odd years ago precisely for the same purpose, so it fits very well. So if you were to say what its most distinctive features were, you would stress community? Certainly community. That every, that every, it's very Christ-centered. Let nothing be put before the love of Christ, says St. Benedict. Let nothing be preferred to, to the love of Christ. It's basically Christianity lived um, with no holds barred, if you like. Everything is aimed at making it possible to live a gospel life, an act of the apostles' life, holding all things in common, and, uh, and prayer and the word. So our life is, apart from the important things like eating and sleeping, is divided three ways between manual work, between prayer and choir, and reading the Bible and books about the Bible and personal prayer, what we call Lectio Divina, which means reading for the sake of reading rather than for the sake of information, if you like. And the whole is designed to produce human beings fully alive, people who are free, people who are living for the glory of God and supporting each other in all the ways required. What, what seems in many ways, one of the things you stressed and struck me most about it was the balance between, as you said, the, the head, the heart and the hands, between practical activities and mental activities. In almost all civilization, what tends to happen is that these are split apart the people who do the mental activities become, they lose interest and indeed renounce and despise mm. practical work and they become Brahmins or they become Confucian teachers or whatever. 
and they do that kind of mental work and the mass of the people do the practical work and you get a growing separation where work is mm. undervalued, devalued mm. as polluting, mm. touching mm. material things. Mm. What seems extraordinary about Benedictines is that they manage to preserve the two alongside each other and that is one of the great contributions they made to the modern world. Would you, would you think that was the case? Yes, but it, I suppose it's because they're biblically based uh, because uh, Genesis presents God creating all the material world and manual work is really just a continuing participation in that, in God's work of conserving and preserving and concreating, if you like, is what we're at. So if it's good enough for God, it ought to be good enough for us. But that's entirely logical but very unusual in, in many ways. Um, Related to that is this very careful regulation of life. Mm -hmm. The order, the, as you mentioned, you have four or five hours of manual practical work, and you have four or five hours of praying, and four or five hours. So everything, in order to fit into the day, all these different things, you have to have a very strict regulation of time and activity in order to do all these things. Is that the case? Yes, indeed. It's what we call a Latin word as usual, because we, our roots are Latin, an orarium, a distribution of the hours. And in his, his rules, St. Benedict lays down the times for the different things to be done, from when you get up, and when you pray, and when you work, when you eat, uh, quite carefully distributed. Though, of course, he was writing for Dark Ages Italy, uh, a long way south of here, where the day length is quite different. And also his timetable was based on the classical day, which in some ways was much more logical than ours. They thought the day began when the sun got up. Mm. So the first hour is when the sun arises rather than in the middle of the night, when merely your digital clock is recording the time. Mm. So re returning to those early days, I mean, one of the reasons why they, there may have been this need to, to have all these different features of life was that it was, if one tries to cast oneself back, this is the time when the, the Roman Empire is collapsing yes. and much of civilization as it had been known was being destroyed and therefore in order to set up a community you couldn't draw as the Romans had on slave labor. The population was fairly likely mm. dispersed and therefore you would have to, if you wanted to set up uh, a working institution, you would have to do the work yourself. And yet you didn't want to forego the prayer and this, the scholarship and the readings. So you really had to work out a very powerful regime which would deal with this problem of fitting what really should take 48 hours into 24 hours. And it seems to me that the, the Benedictines achieved this by two things. One is social engineering. That is, that if you have a community of people who work very well together, very flexibly, very equally, respect each other, and respect the hierarchy, but not too much hierarchy, mm. so that everyone feels they're pooling their efforts mm. together. That kind of social organization is very effective. It's developed recently into some corporations, into the Japanese firm, and these sort mm. of things have that essence of a working community. Mm. So you have social organization, but you also have the development of something which is, I think, one of the great Benedictine uh, contributions, which is the replacement of human labor, if you can. Now, I wondered whether um, you thought those, first of all, those two features, firstly, very well-oiled social organization and community, and secondly, an attention to how work is best done, physical manual work is best done, are features of the order. Uh, yes, I would certainly agree with you about the, the social dynamic, if you like. Again, I think that's a very biblical basis in that you see every human being as somebody beloved by God and whom Christ redeemed, and therefore of infinite and quasi-equal value. So St. Benedict, in organizing his community, says, the community order is to be 
not based on your rank or your riches or your learning, but just the time, the date, the hour when you came to the monastery. So if you're Lord Muck and come at 11 o'clock and, and a slave Paphnutius arrived at half past 10, well, for the rest of his life, Lord Muck remains further down the bed than slave Paphnutius because it doesn't count any longer. It's in the eyes of God. And he's again careful. He says, you're not to call anybody by anything except their religious name, and you're always to call them brother. So you don't say Paphnutius and my Lord Buck. <laughs> you say brother Hosiasius, if that's the name he gets in the monastery, and brother Pambo, if that's what Lord Muck becomes. So again, you stop having social distinctions that set people apart. Uh, and you don't have either to strive, uh, as one often does in other communities, other hierarchically organized societies, to keep your place. When you're 90, you are still where you were. You don't get cast off. You're no longer any good. You can return to the bottom of the pile. Instead, you're a wise senior, venerated for your age and wisdom. And that certainly helps a lot, I think. It, tra it contributes largely to the tranquility of order, the peace, uh, personal and institutional. And people work together. This fraternal support, what St. Bendit calls the fraterna acies, the He's very fond of military metaphors. He's talking about the line of battle where you have a, a row of Roman soldiers all holding up their shields and protecting one another and all whipping out their swords and having a go at the opposition. You're not on your own, assailed by a multitude of enemies. You're one of, a, of brothers all working together. And he's very much inspired by the, the psalm verse, how good and pleasant it is brothers to del dwell together in unity. But I think there's, I mean, there's so many things, interesting things you're saying. One of them reminds me of someone's assertion that perhaps the modern welfare state owes something from, to the Benedictines because this idea that you put as, what, as much as you can into mm. the community and then towards the end of your, your life or if you're sick or whatever, mm. the community will support you as, a, as your right. Mm. And so that idea uh, it comes from it. And the second, your point about everyone coming in equal, what, what the Benedictines do, which was also achieved in some organizations, is that they take people who voluntarily come into an organization, make them completely level and equal, and then give them a commitment for life and an involvement in the institution, which turns it into a kind of birth status group, mm. but it's on, the, on a voluntary basis. Mm. So they manage to mix choice and what you want mm. to do, and I presume you could leave if you absolutely wanted to, but you commit yourself mm. and then you, you become one body in, mm. in a sense. Mm. So it's a lovely mixture of these two yes. principles. It's interesting too that St. Benedict is not totally rigid in that he says to the abbot, but if he wants to, if he thinks there's a good reason, he can promote or demote people. So if he thinks that uh, someone has gifts which make him more useful uh, in charge of things, then he can move him up, either temporarily, well, usually temporarily, and, but he still retains his original rank so that when he stops being a responsible official, he still knows where he is. He still slots in into the community. And when an abbot dies or resigns, for example, then everybody just reverts to their, the rank they had when they came in. Mm. So again, you don't have anybody saying, I'm important, mm. uh, I'm special, listen mm. to me or watch me. Mm. And everyone's wearing the same habit. And exactly. And you can't, you can't tell from, from what I'm wearing whether mm. I'm an important person or an unimportant person. I'm just a, just a monk, <laughs> which is... Uh, people from outside find that very difficult sometimes because they like to be able to pigeonhole people as what they are rather than as who they are. Mm. So the world tends to 
want to know what you are, you know, mm. are you an important person, are you an influential person, rather than who you are. It's not what you make, what, what, not what you produce, but who you are, that's what's, what's monks are interested in. Yes, it's very like a Japanese firm where everyone, the top managers mm. down to the workforce, wear the same clothes, mm. they eat in the same refectory, mm. there's no, and they have similar offices mm. and so on, or workspaces. Mm. Um, so there's no difference, mm. and that creates a great, great sense of mm -hmm. bond cohesion. and cohesion and, mm -hmm. and mutual solidarity and hard work mm -hmm. and involvement. Mm -hmm. You benefit from helping other people mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. all goes back yes. and forth all the time. Turning to the other strategy for overcoming what seems to me a, a terribly difficult situation. You had a great civilization of Rome had collapsed. You've got constant warfare, you've got raidings from the Vikings, you've got Islam on one side, and for 500 years, these little illuminated areas, oases of culture and learning, which carried on the traditions of Rome, carried on the crafts, carried on the literature, the philosophy, they were the, the one bridge over which Roman civilization could pass. They were faced not only with that responsibility and, and task, but also that um, there was the other side of trying to deal with a very diffi difficult situation where a civilization had collapsed, where there was political disorder, threats, economic chaos, a light population and so on, was to try and improve the technology. Because what strikes one and what is famous about the Benedictine, certainly in the later period, is their use of mechanical devices. They had to make their own living, they couldn't use slaves and they couldn't use serfs, so they had to do all the hard farm work. On the other hand, if they had done all the grinding, the pounding, and so on, they would have had no time for their prayers. So they, being intelligent people, intellectuals who had to think of a way of improving their lot, and this is what makes them different from any other Mandarin class who can let the peasants do what they like as long as they produce the goods, they themselves would pay the cost if they didn't do things efficiently. Mm. So they very early on realized that there were a lot of jo jobs that could be done by non-human power. They just directed it. So characteristically, as in this um, abbey, you had water was a requisite mm. of founding one uh, an abbey. So you needed this for mills and for pounding and for all sorts of purposes. They later developed water mills, windmills, all sorts of milling and other devices. Is this uh, an important characteristic, do you think? I don't know. It's, just, it's not actually something I'd thought about greatly in terms of ancient monasticism. St. Benedict says in his rule, then they are truly monks when they do the work of the fields themselves, which implies that certainly sometimes they weren't doing it all themselves, but equally it wasn't abnormal for them to do it and his rule is full of prescriptions about varying the diet or the times of meals or what to drink and when and how much depending on the kind of work you're doing and what the climate is and whether it's hot summer or whatever. But I think you're probably right in that monks tend to be, in my experience anyway, lateral thinkers. <laughs> if you've got some you, simply because you've got people doing jobs that if they were in the world, in, in inverted commas, they would be overqualified for. Exactly. If you have somebody with a doctorate, you don't give them a bucket and say, go and feed the pigs. Mm -hmm. You say, you must do something worthy of your skill and everything else, because you're extremely expensive to employ and carrying two buckets full of pigs will is mm -hmm. not worth it. But on the other hand, when you do get somebody who has a bit of a mind, especially if it's a practical mind, and you go and tell them to feed the pigs, you tend to say to himself, well, life is a bit busy, how can I, how can I think of a way of feeding the pigs which will speed things up or make it a little less complicated? And while the solutions produced by monks may not be always those that would appeal to conventional mind, they usually work. And I've certainly seen some very strange <laughs> but effective solutions to these problems. And I'm sure that's true, that uh, the 
part of the monastic vocation is clearly too contrapped to produce contraptions. <laughs> and again, a, we, we look at ancient authors and they were full of ideas of how to do things, measuring this or that or driving this or that. And if you've got ancient authors available to you because you've preserved the manuscripts or copied them, then your, that wisdom is available to you. You can take it and adapt it and apply it. And certainly monks seem to have done that. They were pioneers in lots of things and in some ways still are. This leads to what seems to me a sad paradox, which I um, think you might have thought about. Here is a, an organization which is dedicated to the worship of God and the pursuit of his way. And yet many historians have cruelly suggested that what some people think of as this arid, cold, capitalist world which we now live in is one of the great products of the Benedictine orders, the connection between capitalism and the Benedictines. Mm. I wondered whether you'd thought about whether there is a connection and how it could be connected. Well, I suppose the sheer accumulation, if you like, of wealth would be a danger because it's a very famous truism, a commonplace, that what you possess possesses you. And that's why St. Benedict is very strong on monks not possessing anything of their own. The trouble is that you may not have anything of your own, but as a body you can accumulate. And again, the fact that you are a stable body, if you have a great landed family, all it requires is a reversal of political fortune or a failure to produce a male heir or whatever, and everything goes down the tubes. Whereas if you're a monastery, it tends to keep on. There are ups and downs. But I think historically monasteries last an average of about 300 years, which is quite a long time. You can do quite a lot of accumulating in that time. Uh, and, and that's, that's a danger. It's quite, I was thinking about this curiously this morning. The, uh, Edward I, I think, it made it illegal for you to be able to give, uh, leave money and lands to monasteries and such like institutions without royal permission to try and curb this accumulation. Whereas nowadays the government makes it very difficult for you to get rid of things, because things like the Charity Commissioners, unless it's in your trust deed or whatever, that you can give it all away. You can't. They insist on you retaining it. <laughs> so the, the, the clock has turned round, as it were. Yes. Uh, and also the monasteries, I suppose, again, in line with what you said about their, their pioneering methods, the Cistercians were notorious, I think, doomed, they had their own merchant fleet, didn't they? Mm for carrying wool about and wool products. And if the trouble is, if you live simply, then you do tend to accumulate money. If you have a conspicuous consumption and the medieval equivalent of a Rolls Royce and caviar at every meal and color television in mm. every room and so on, well, you, you, you don't, running up large sums of money isn't a problem. It's debt that are the problem. Whereas if you say, well, we will eat uh, a poor diet and live in basic conditions and not have anything very fancy except in the church, and if you were a Cistercian you would say no, not even in the church, then it's very easy to accumulate large sums. And I think Knowles says that at the beginning of the 13th century, roughly one, between one and two percent of the population was monastic. So you translate that to today, something between half a million and a million monks in Britain. That's a heck of a lot of folk, <laughs> and is bound to have an impact on things. And a heck of a lot of folk, because they're so well organized, because they've developed very advanced accounting systems. Mm. They're very regular, they're mm. very balanced, their accounts, mm. their technology, their farming mm. technology, their craft technology, mm. their use of um, machines is mm. all very advanced. So they're very efficient mm. producers, and mm. they can't get rid of it, as mm. you say. But a, another aspect, um, another suggestion that's been made, which is interesting, is the connection between Benedictines and time. Mm. I wondered if you had thought about what, they might, what c 
specific connections there might be between those, the origin of our modern concepts of time and the Benedictines. Well, obviously, one, if you have an ordered day, then you need to be aware of the passage of time with sufficient precision to be able to say, right, stop doing this and start doing that. Uh, and if the, the ancient world used sundials a great deal, and they, they are pretty reliable as long as the sun is there, I suppose you could use one under the moon. I've never thought about it. Mm. But uh, obviously getting up in the morning is a problem, or it can be if you get up in the middle of the night. St. Benedict says it should be a careful brother who gives the signal for the work of God. That's his jargon term for services in church. And if the brother fails, then the abbot's to do it. But I don't know whether in early days how you could do that. I mean, a sundial doesn't give you any interval of time. It doesn't ring a bell or anything like that. Uh, if you have a candle that burns at a reasonably constant rate, all right, you can say such and such a passage of time has gone because it's burned halfway down. That means six hours or three hours or whatever. All right, but again, it doesn't give you any time signal. Uh, same would be true of an, an hourglass. So you, that is a problem. And it seems to have been one that monks worked on. Now, when they first had an answer, I don't know. But there's a, a famous story in the chronicle of the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds. They had a fire in 1198. And it, it records, apparently it was because they stuck one half burnt candle on top of another in the sacristy and uh, they came unstuck and started a fire. But the interesting thing is that it occurred near where the clock was and it was a water-driven clock. Water escaping from one bit into another and uh, moving things on. I suppose in some ways like a mini water wheel and thus turning it into rotary motion which could then be shown as hands. I don't think they worried much about minutes. I think they're only hours. But if you've got something turning round, then you can trip something by a cam, make a bell ring, or give some audible signal. So that's 1198. And uh, Maria de Ripo, according to the manuscripts, and nobody knows exactly what the date is. Some people say the 8th, some people say the 10th century manuscripts. So that's obviously earlier than Barry St. Edmunds. They had a, a clock shown in that too. Um, but how accurate it was. Uh, it was a chiming clock too. But the, what we might call clockwork clocks didn't come till rather later. Um, they think that they were coming in about the time this monastery started, early 1200s, mid 1200s. And Cluny had its first clock that we know of in 1340, and so 100 years later. But it was, they were expensive things to have. How practical they were, I don't know, because you always had to have somebody to wind it. You, really, if you bought a clock, you had to buy a winder as well. And they were not accurate in their timekeeping. Their regulation was inaccurate. And uh, they were more, really, status symbols, and people were it seems more interested in rather Heath Robinson affairs. The more cogwheels and things you had going round, the better, really. It wasn't simplicity they were after. And they were fascinated by the movements of the planets and the stars as well. So you had little orreries showing all these things. Because, you see, their interest in time wasn't only what time to get up, but seasons of the year. Because if you have a life which is liturgical based on things like Easter and Christmas and all the rest, you need to know the passage of time on the longer scale. And Easter, as we know, you want to know what time Easter is next year. You pull out your diary and look at 2000 and it says it's such and such a date. But if you didn't have a diary, you couldn't. You had to know when the first Sunday after the first full moon after 21st of March was. So you needed to know when the first full moon was, which is why the quadrivium, the, the four 
other liberal arts of the ancient world were maths, uh, in the sense of geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music, which are all based on, obviously, numbers. And if you could do that, you could work out dates and times and everything else. And things like architecture and all very number-based, uh, root two squares and all that sort of thing. And also they, they found a great symbolism in all that. So numbers and machines for telling numbers and calculations were things that fascinated them. Mm. Well, I think the, the time story, which you've told very well, uh, shows the way in which there was already a, a great need or desire or interest mm. in time, both for its symbolic interest and practical interest, well before the first mechanical mm. clock. Mm. So they needed something yes. um, better, a better yes. machine for doing yes. it. Like you, I'm puzzled about how they could have woken up. They had to pray often in the north of mm. Europe. It was mm. more of a problem than yes. in the middle of the night on a cold night when everything had frozen up, the water clock had frozen yes. up, there's no sun. Correct. How, A, did they know, and B, what triggered a bell to mm. ring them up? Otherwise, they'd have just slept through it. So it is a puzzle, but certainly later on they developed yes. clocks. I think it probably having lived a monastic life in the northernmost Benedictine Abbey in the world for something over a quarter of a century. I think it's less of a problem than you might think, because when you live a regular life, some people at any rate are very good at being regular. Uh, I'm not good at getting up, but there are others who are, and if all the clocks stopped, I know some of the brethren who would rise instantly and accurately at the right time. And although I'm not good at that, I would certainly, in common with many of my brethren, say, what's happened to the stop work bell? Or what has happened to the Vespers bells? They should be ringing. And I would expect to be right, just by a, a, a habit, really. Uh, and this is the time it should happen. Mm. Uh, not quite Pavlovian, but <laughs> <laughs> getting that way. That's a very interesting practical. Uh, uh, something you mentioned about mathematics mm. and, and, and learning reminds me of something we ought to mention in mm. passing, which is the educational role of the mm. Benedictines. Mm. They were great educators mm. and scholars mm. and maintained. I see that we're sitting in a room which is surrounded by books and libraries and they started schools and so on. I mean, I don't think there's a question, but it's just mm. necessary to emphasize mm. that the, the love of learning and the respect for mm. learning is a central part of the Benedictine order. Yes, uh, Jean de Klerk wrote a famous book, Le, uh, Le Klerk rather, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God. Mm. The two were very closely identified. I suppose it's like St. Thomas's thing that uh, the one and the good and the true are mutually exchangeable terms really, because it's part of of the greatness and goodness of God. If, if it's true, then it's of God. And learning is an ex exploration into God's creation in, and therefore into God, into facets of God's being. And I, I think that, quite apart from a quite normal human curiosity, that was what partly at least drove them. That is actually very important. When I talked to a Zen Buddhist monk, I made the distinction between Zen Buddhism, which tends to want to know about yourself, mm. about your inner state, mm. and Christianity, which tends to believe that looking for God's purpose in this world mm. and understanding nature mm. and God's creation is a worthy activity mm. for a Christian. Mm. And what you said, yeah. which is that to understand this world is a worthy task, is that right, isn't it? Yes. I think it's, it's an interesting, again, compare and contrast, the Eastern seeking nothingness. It seems to be a self-emptying, I suppose, you'd need to correct me on this probably, to be submerged in the divine in whatever way that's understood. Whereas the, the Western seeking of, of, of nothing is so as to make room for more. You, you, you chuck things out to leave more room for God uh, and by becoming more godly in a very real sense. You, you become more yourself without losing your identity. 
it's you become precisely more yourself rather than less yourself. Whereas I think in the Eastern, as I have understood it, the mm. Eastern way, you are you become less yourself in a sense. You're more lost in mm. the whole. Would that be true? Mm. I think it is. And when you say making more room for God, mm. that also includes making more ro room for all of God's knowledge and all his laws mm. and everything he's mm. done. Yes. So learning about his world is, yes. is you can fill yourself with that knowledge yes. in a worthwhile yeah. way. Yes, there are facets of, mm. of him. And again, the, the Hebrew Bible is, is very much more a tour around God, looking at mm. God in different ways, rather than, I suppose, a Hellenistic mm. approach, which would like to define God in three words, you know, mm. boil him down to a quintessence. Mm. You know, whereas the, the Jewish approach is much more, let's glory in the whole thing mm. and, and find more facets to enjoy. Mm. So, if you could explain to me, uh, as someone who's never been a, a monk, what would be an, a sort of normal monastic day? You start at whatever time you start. In our case, uh, the first service is at quarter to five in the morning, and that will last anything from an hour and a half to a couple of hours or so, depending on the psalms and the readings and the, the rank of the celebration. Then after that, we have half an hour or so's reading, and then a, another very short service of about 10 minutes, followed by a time of something of the order of an hour and a half, which can be devoted to, to various things like reading and breakfast and this and that. Um, then on a weekday, we've got mass at quarter to nine, and that will last with terse bolted on the end, terse being another of these little short services. That lasts about three quarters of an hour, then after that we've got time for work. Well, work again will vary, and it be training the young monks, it be working in the garden, making stained glass windows, book binding, administration of all kinds, keeping the accounts of which you spoke earlier, mm. uh, looking after the needs of the guests, retreatants, and the shop, the bees, any number of, of and all the, the simple things like painting and cleaning and changing the oil in the car or whatever. All these, these things, they all go on all the time, mowing the lawn. Then that will go on till uh, quarter past twelve, and then there's a, a period to get changed out of your working gear into something suitable for church. There's a short ten minute service uh, just after half past twelve, and that's followed by lunch, during which uh, one of the monks reads to the others, so you're not just feeding your your belly, you're feeding your mind and heart as well. You start with a bit of scripture and then go on to something else. And again, one of the brethren will serve the others, again on the model of Christ who served the apostles. And meanwhile there are other monks washing up and cooking, doing other exciting things like that. So when everybody's finished their lunch, they have to have their lunch. So there's a gap until quarter past two when we have noon, the night hour, it's this curious classical day, and uh, another ten minute service, again followed by work in its various and diverse forms. Quarter to five we stop, again there's time for reading for an hour or so, then evening prayer vespers is at six, then we, we pray in silence in common for a bit, supper's at seven, that same format as lunch, but obviously a simpler meal. Then after that, we have what we call recreation, which means we, we gather together and talk and do what? Mend your socks or make groceries or just chat or do whatever you like together. Then bef at eight o'clock, we have chapter when there's a reading from some suitable book, uh, prayer intentions, any notices that need to be given out. Then we go into church for Compline, which means completion, the end of the day, it's the last service, that lasts 20 minutes or so. And then, in theory, that's the end of the day, apart from tidying things up and shutting things down. And uh, we go to bed at that stage, mm. and that is a day. It's a busy day, very, very carefully regulated. It reminds me of my school days, except, of course, we didn't have all these prayers, but yeah. we had each lesson three quarters yeah. of an hour and so on. It's the difference between our timetable and your school days. 
with its regimented day was that if you were out of order in those days, some sanction would have been applied to you, physical or otherwise, uh, little doubt, because you had to do it, whereas we're doing it voluntarily because we choose to do it. Mm. Uh, that's, I think, a big difference. Mm. Could you just very briefly paint a portrait of the importance of the monastic orders in the period roughly 1350, 1400, that sort of period, before the Reformation? Were there a lot of monks, and what did they do? They, yes, there were certainly a lot of monks. I was told recently by somebody who should know that there were about 200 monasteries uh, a little mm -hmm. before the, Mon the Reformation, and those would be Benedictines, I suppose, mm -hmm. and then you had uh, Cistercians and regular canons mm -hmm. and friars. So there were monasteries and monks and religious everywhere because life was not divided into God's bit and everybody else's bit. If you go to Ghana, where we have a monastery now, you see the lorries have got, you know, God is on my side painted on mm. them instead of, you know, whatever motto mm. you is on, or even just a, a reference, a biblical reference, you know, Psalm mm. 51, verse 3. Mm. Uh, and, and God comes into everything quite naturally, and that was the case before the Reformation. It was the, the wallpaper against the, which the whole of life was seen. It wasn't something separate. And you didn't have the National Health Service running hospitals. You had hospital, hospital orders doing that. You didn't have uh, a chain of hotels. You could stay in a monastery. Uh, the whole... The idea of service and gratuitous service, doing things for free, out of love of your fellow man and woman because they needed it, was what drove the whole thing. Uh, and, and that, I think, is probably a very large difference. Mm. One last um, thing that has puzzled me. As you probably know, the origin of monastic institutions is usually thought to be in Buddhist uh, monasteries mm. well before the second mm. century. Mm. It, the 5th century mm. BC mm. or something like this. And indeed, some people say that the monastic idea came into the Western world from India mm. through the Middle East and then into Christianity. Mm. And certainly the Buddhist monastic orders, as I've seen them in uh, Nepal and in Japan, are very like the Benedictines, simplicity of life, attention to God, careful regulation of the body and hygiene, hard work, contemplation, special costumes and so on. And yet, the Buddhist orders of East Asia didn't lead into any kind of capitalist world, whereas Benedictines certainly are one of the contributors towards modern industrial mm. activity and modern capitalist mm. mentality. Mm. I wondered whether you had any ideas about why there should be this difference of effect. It's a fascinating question. Uh, and I don't really know enough about Eastern monasticism, especially in its, if you like, cenobitic, its living together aspects, because I suspect that that is one reason why, uh, if, you, if you're living on your own, having your nine bean rows is, is all right. You can live quite simply. But if you have several hundred people living together, then you have to organize life to be able to support yourselves. That always strikes me. You know, you hear these stories of a, an army of 100,000 men going through a medieval countryside. Well, even if they all live on a handful of oatmeal each, uh, it, it, they take up, that's an awful lot of oatmeal and uh, uh, a lot of space and a lot of organization required. That's why I think they only went campaigning when the, the harvest was in and that sort of thing. The people were available for it. Uh, and uh, I think you just, if you were living in a, a society where you couldn't go down the road to Tesco's mm. for your groceries or anything else, you had to be organized. And I think that's why sometimes when you look at a medieval monster, you say, what a huge place it was. But then if you had to have your own smith, if you had your own tannery, if you had to have your own stores for seed and vegetables, all these sorts of things, um, 
places for horses, and obviously yeah, if you have a horse and you've got to feed it and you've got somewhere to keep it saddlery and somewhere to repair its saddlery, it all takes up a lot of space. Uh, and uh, in some senses you've got no, ex no cho choice to be other than, than self-sufficient to whatever extent you can be, especially if you have other people depending on you. Yes. I think that um, the point you made about um, self-sufficiency and so on is, is very important. My guess, like you, it, is that there's something about the nature of the monastic organization mm. in the two ends of the mm. world, so to speak, which differentiates them. I think probably celibacy is not quite as important in Buddhism, mm. so property and, and so on tends to get a bit more di yeah. diffused. But I think in the end what it shows, the difference shows, is that like all technologies, and if you include mm. Benedictines mm. as a great sort of social technology, mm. religious technology, the context makes all the difference. Buddhism came into civilizations which were already heavily populated, very mm. sophisticated, with rice mm. cultivation mm. often later on. And this led them to fit in very mm. well. Mm. They were usually subordinate to the political mm. powers, mm. and it was already, they were just part of the society. Mm. The Benedictines, and they set up a sort of, I can see you're not agreeing, yes, <laughs> they, they were freer than certainly some religious orders, and mm. therefore you begin to get a tension and a separateness about the Benedictines and therefore they have much more force mm. than the rather more subdued mm. Buddhist orders. Mm. That's just one of the many features. Uh -huh. Yes, I wonder how much too the, the fact that you, if you come from a Roman civilization where the Romans were already great engineers and builders and practical people, if you like, uh, that was uh, an honored profession, building mm. roads and bridges and uh, making siege engines uh, and, and solving practical problems whereas one gets the impression that is less the case in the eastern roots of Buddhism. Mm. Uh, and if, you, if that's where you come from, that's where you'll go to, I would think, mm. if that's the road you're already pointed down. Mm. Uh, I, in, I, mean, I think, all right, the Benedictines were at times quite uh, powerful bodies, but really, surely, that it was very much an up and down thing. It's only after mm. the likes of Cluny mm. or the Cistercians, you had the struggle between the, the sort of sacerdotium and renium, the, 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 the throne and altar, if mm. you like. And uh, the struggle that monasteries and religious institutes always had to be independent precisely because if you could put your man in or your mm. woman in as abbess or abbot or as bishop or whatever, you could control the springs of power, or get money, or whatever. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, some people have said clocks equals Benedictine, mm. Benedictines equal clocks. Mm. How could there be such a, an equation? Uh, interesting. I, I've heard clocks equal gunners, or clocks equals locksmiths, I suppose, just because they are makers thereof, but perhaps clocks equals Benedictines as users thereof, because if you have a need to divide time or predict time, or chop it off into bits, then obviously you need a means thereof, and a clock, if it works, is, is good for that, and especially at times when nobody's around or when you don't have the sun or something like that. Mm. I've, I've heard a rather interesting idea that basically what the Benedictines did was to enclose space and time physically in mm. their architecture, mm. socially in their social organization, and then divide it all up into tiny bits. So in a sense they were a living clock, mm. a kind of physical social clock in their order. Yes, in the sense that at such and such a time they'd yes, be in the uh, refectory, yes, that, or this that's, time they'd be in the That's right, so they were all little bits or... of a clock, uh -huh. each one of them was a little bit. Uh -huh. And all that happened was that they miniaturized it down into an actual physical object, which then became a mechanical clock. So this is a, an unmechanical, this is an organic clock, <laughs> which was later turned into a mechanical clock. Rather ingenious idea. Uh, yes, yes. I think it probably would have appealed to uh, early monks who liked to incorporate into their architecture their theories of theology. And so you have squares and circles and all these things. If you look at the architecture, the drip courses divide the walls into equal bits. Mm. So you can see a circle, that, the, without beginning or end, God's infinity, or a square, 
sides equal and angles equal, all, all these sorts of things. They were full of, wouldn't call them conceits, but I suppose ways of incorporating a deeper symbolism and mm. in, in, in making something that's merely utilitarian, symbolically useful as well, pointing the mind in the direction it should go all the time. But one of the sadnesses, again, like the paradox of capitalism, and, is that there's a theory that by doing this, by capturing time, bring it down into the Benedictine order and then later into a clock, mm. you finally lost God because most of the religious systems keep the time is driven by celestial powers, mm. by the sun and the moon mm. and the stars, mm. and that's how you regulate time. Mm. Time is out there with God mm. and we just reflect it. Mm. When man slowly captured it and put it in a mm. cage, in a clock, mm. we make the world and we make the clocks mm. and we make time mm. and then finally after Newton time was ours mm. and God was forgotten and floated yeah. off into yeah. outer space. I suppose, yes, it's curious, our, our world is much more a liturgical world, seasonal driven if you like, so Advent, Lent, Christmas, Easter, they're the, mm. what shape the day. And if you ask a monk what day it is, you'll see him think and he's saying, right, today is the St. Peter and Paul, ergo it's the 29th of June, rather than what's today is 29th of June, ergo it's St. Peter and Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and our, uh, you know, it, it's what time is it? It's time for sext, mm -hmm. ergo it's half past twelve. Mm -hmm. Rather than it's half past twelve, ergo it's time for sext. Uh, it's still informed by the original values, I trust. You're moving through time rather like um, many tribal peoples move, pastoral mm. peoples move through space. Mm. There's a famous story about one transhuman pastoralist mm. who date their year by where they are. So mm. when they come to a valley with mushrooms mm. and they know it must be May, mm. and then when they come to another place they know it must be October, mm. they don't say, ah, well it's May, we better go there. Mm. They do it from the activities and many societies I've been mm. in, you ask them what time it is and they have no idea, they say, well, we're doing this, it mm. must be about so-and-so. Sure. We're milking the buffalo, it Correct. must be about this time. Correct. We, of course, sit, look at our watch and say, time to milk the buffalo, yes, and then yes. you go off. Yes. The rhythm, your religious rhythm, is the same as these agrarian rhythms yes. in many parts of the world. Yes, and again, it's, it's, I suppose it's interaction with the outside world in inverted commas, that people come here from outside and they expect to find a given service at a given time. Mm rather than mm. when we do it, mm. and especially with a, a climate like ours where you're in the northern latitudes and the day length varies mm. so enormously from effectively endless light in the high summer mm. to the stage where the sun rises at quarter to ten in the winter and is gone by quarter past two in the afternoon. <laughs> so if you kept to a, a classical day of like 12 hours at night mm. and 12 hours in a day, you would be like a speeded up film during the day, sort of pinky and perky, you know, everything being done in high speed, and slow motion yes. in the night. But this led to one of the great paradoxes. When the Japanese started getting Western clocks, they had a terrible problem because they divided the, the day into hours. But the hours, there were six hours, I think it was, or five hours mm. in the day and five mm. hours at night. Mm. But of course it was seasonal. Mm. So the hours shrank and expanded. Yes. Sometimes an hour was five minutes sure. by our time and so on, and they tried to make Western clocks with expanding hours oh, right. and shrinking hours, and they did it, being yes. Japanese. They yes. did these wonderful clocks, but it was some feat, and, yes. and luckily our hours became standardized. Yes. Um, anyway, I think perhaps yes. we ought to stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Yes,